Good morning, good afternoon, and especially good evening to the viewers in Asia, since it is 9 p.m. back home in Hong Kong, and welcome to our quarterly AFC Fund webinar. My name is Thomas Hooker, and I'm the CEO and founder of Asia Frontier Capital. With me today are Ruchi Desai in Hong Kong, who is managing together with me the AFC Asia Frontier Fund. Ahmed Dabak Charlie, the chief strategist of the AFC Iraq Fund, is today in London. Scott Osheroff, the Chief Investment Officer of the AFC Uzbekistan Fund joins us from Tashkent in Uzbekistan. And Vicente Nguyen, the CIO of the AFC Vietnam Fund, is based in Ho Chi Minh City and will talk about the investment opportunities in Vietnam. This webinar will last about 45 minutes. And thereafter, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during our 15 minutes Q&A session after the presentations. You can submit your questions online through the Q&A icon at the bottom of this Zoom window on your laptop or computer. The first quarter of 2023 was overshadowed by the US banking crisis and the collapse of Credit Suisse. Fortunately, there was not a great impact for banks in the Asian frontier markets. The recent turmoil has pushed some of our AFC funds key evaluations to all-time lows, and we view this as an investment opportunity, especially for the AFC Asia Frontier Fund and AFC Vietnam Fund. All four of funds uh, should have achieved a positive performance this month, especially our AFC Iraq Fund, which is this month, as of today, up about 15%. Uh, which pushes the year-to-day performance to over 45% and makes the AFC Rock Fund this year to one of the best performing fund in the world. But let's listen to the fund managers now. As usual, Ruchi Desai will provide us with an economic update first, an investment outlook thereafter for the AFC for uh, Asian Frontier Markets and the AFC Asia Frontier Fund. Ruchi, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and welcome everyone to another quarterly webinar, which is conducted by AFC and good to have all of you on. Uh, so probably I'll just walk through some inter introductory slides. Uh, the year has started off actually very well for our universe, as this chart shows you the Asian, most of the Asian frontier markets have done pretty well so far until the end of April. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, the Iraq fund is up almost 15% uh, for the month and almost, uh, I think, 43 or 44% for the year. So Iraq, the Iraqi market has seen a very strong rebound this year. Also, Sri Lanka has done very well, all, up almost 23% in dollar terms. And Kazakhstan as well has, has seen a pretty strong rebound. Uh, and the AFC Asia Fund, fund itself, because of our markets doing pretty well, has started start of the year also quite strong at about 6.4% uh, returns for the year so far which is well ahead of the benchmark, which is the MSCI Frontier Asia Index, which is basically flat for the year. So overall, a pretty good start for, for the year, for the Asian Frontier Universe and also for our fund. And one thing which kind of stands out is the lack of, I would say, low correlation of Asian Frontier markets compared to global markets, especially over the last couple of months, given what's been happening in the US and Europe with respect to the banking crisis and talk about high inflation, high interest rates and slow economic growth. Our markets have done pretty well. Uh, despite all that noise. And as the next slide shows you, uh, you know, uh, the next slide uh, basically talks about or gives illustration of uh, the impact of the banking sector crisis in the US and Europe last, especially in March last month. Uh, as this chart shows you, the MSCI US banks index was is down about 11% so far this year. But that doesn't really affect our universe in a very direct way because Pretty much all the banks or the banking sector in our, in our market, so our countries are very much focused on the domestic economy, focusing on uh, the domestic banking products, traditional banking, uh, lending and, and deposit products, no you know, exotic products out there. Uh, and also the stock price performance on this chart shows you some of the uh, banks that the fund holds uh, for, for the AFC Asia Frontier Fund and also one for the Iraq Fund. Uh, I mean, they've significantly outperformed not just uh, the benchmarks were also given what's happening globally in the banking sector. They've done very well. So again, lack of correlation for uh, many of our markets against what's happening in the US and Europe in the last couple of months. So again, I would like to point out less correlations or less impacted by what's happening, at least from a banking sector perspective. Of course, from a global interest rate inflation perspective, that's affecting pretty much every market of the last 12 or 18 months, which I'll talk about in the following slides as well. So if you can move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, just talk, talking a bit about U.S. inflation and interest rates. Uh, yes, inflation and interest rates are very important in emerging markets, you know, in, in this part of the world, in Asia, in India, and uh, other ASEAN countries or Europe, like UK or the EU. But I think 
that's all that's all good but i think most important is, is what happens in the us with interest rates and inflation because that's what drives sentiment globally and policy making globally so i think just a word on us inflation and interest rates i think is a bit important so as this chart shows you inflation has been coming off in the us still a bit high compared to historical terms and core has been a bit sticky but still uh, the overall inflation number about 5% has been coming off it's back to where it was in may 2021 so yeah trending down uh, let's see how it goes for the next couple of months but my feeling is that you'll see you see this number coming down even more going forward for a couple of reasons which i'll talk about later as well and as the next slide shows you i think uh in my view i think we're pretty much done with uh, the aggressive interest rate hikes that we saw from the from the us fed uh, last year i think consensus is that they maybe do 25 basis points more uh, maybe even not in 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 i would say i think next week is the policy meeting so i think after that they'll probably not raise more maybe they hold for longer uh, can't say for sure but let's see how that goes uh, i think uh, the jury is out there in terms of where they start cutting by the end of this year or early next year or where they hold for longer depending on inflation numbers uh, but basically the bottom line is i think central banks globally especially the us where is done with their aggressive interest rate hikes and also as the table on the on the right of the of the of the slide shows you these are some of the asian central banks uh which have had the recent monetary policy meeting in the last probably uh four to six four to eight weeks and everyone almost all of them actually held their interest rates and gave a guidance of holding interest rates for the uh better part of this year or at least for the next policy uh, next monetary policy meetings and in fact some stood out vietnam actually cut interest rates just a couple of uh, just last month actually that was a bit of a surprise but they did cut interest rates by 25 basis points to support the economy going forward as well but otherwise only new zealand and pakistan raised but the rest basically held uh so i think we are we are, we are through that we are through, through those headwinds of high inflation and high interest rates and i think this year will be uh, i mean last year everyone spoke about high interest rates high inflation i think this year is going to be pretty much the opposite where most investors or in general uh, the investing class talks about lower interest rates or at least lower inflation and peaking out of interest rates which should be positive for investor sentiment uh so that's a bit about uh interest rates and in inflation in the US and moving on to the next slide and just just supporting the the out to the supporting the the call for lower inflation i guess many of the indicators that led to high inflation in the last couple of years have been trending down these are this is the food the world food index has been coming off from its uh, highs which 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 was which took place last year after the war in ukraine still high compared to 2020 and first half 2021 but still trending down which is very positive especially for our universe because many countries in a universe like bangladesh pakistan and sri lanka import a lot of their edible oil as well as uh, as well as food food uh, requirements so that's very helpful for them from a, just from a current account perspective and also in managing their whole economy and and inflation and interest rates going forward uh, and also as the next slide shows even commodity prices like crude oil and natural gas uh, and other commodities have been coming off from their highs reached the last year after the war in ukraine uh in fact even even though the opec uh cut production just a couple of weeks ago i think oil prices down 3% for the year so not not much of that cut didn't have much of an impact so far on oil prices but in general i think the current oil price is manageable by most of the oil importers in in the asian front universe and also in asia since many countries in asia are, are oil importers so overall again very positive for inflation and just overall macro stability for our universe as well and also as the next slide shows you uh, besides low commodity prices and low inflation i think dollar has also has weakened since its peak in september of last year so the usd index is down about 10% uh, in the last 6 or 7 months which is which is very beneficial not just for stock market sentiment as you can see the emerging market index has rallied since the dollar has weakened uh, which is the green line uh, which is the emerging market index but even from a currency perspective many currencies which depreciated a lot last year given the raising of us uh, interest rates in the us and also the the strong dollar uh, many currencies have actually strengthened this year uh, standard of sri lankan rupee has strengthened by about 15% this year so it's very positive for many other currencies in our markets as well so overall uh things are from a macro perspective are looking much better now compared to even 6 or 7 months ago and as of, of course much better than the same time last year when the war had just began and begun in ukraine you had high commodity prices high interest rates and high inflation so overall much benign macro position compared to maybe 12 months ago uh, lower inflation uh, interest rates speaking out lower commodity prices 
and of course more stable currencies which is helping overall macroeconomic stability in our countries as well uh, moving forward uh, so i'll just talk a bit about uh, gdp growth prospects i think imf actually the downgrade downgrade global growth prospects for this year by a few i think by 0.1% uh, but that's not surprising given that this news flow has been coming out for last couple of months about slow economic growth globally but i think as investors we look beyond just 2023 for economic growth i think we look at the more longer term and if you look at this chart this is the average gdp growth between 2023 and 2027 which is the five year average gdp growth uh, and and the imf uh, the imf may have cut gdp growth for some of our, some of our markets for 2023 but if we if you look at the long term growth uh, over the next five years as this chart compares this is the uh, gdp growth forecast for Oct Oct for april 2023 versus october 2022 uh, there's not much change for Asian frontier markets. It's about 4.4% GDP growth uh, over the next five years. As there's no change over that. So in the longer term, still pretty strong prospects of economic growth for our markets. Uh, that's because these markets, especially our countries, are benefiting from trends like supply chain diversification from China into, say, Bangladesh and Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, very attractive demographics, a young population. Uh, increasing disposable income, improving infrastructure, uh, more reforms. So, so pretty much uh, a lot of important factors driving longer term GDP growth in our markets. For example, Bangladesh and Vietnam should be back to doing 6% plus GDP growth from 2024 onwards. And even this year, they should be doing about 5%, if not more, which is still a pretty good number to have in this kind of environment. And also Central Asia is doing very well. Georgia, Uzbekistan will be showing pretty solid growth rates over the next five years as well. So overall, uh, pretty uh, pretty decent uh, growth prospects from a overall macroeconomic growth perspective for our universe. And in the following slides, uh, I'll probably just talk about the impact of, uh, I mean, there have been questions or from investors or in general uh, that you know, slow economic growth in the US and Europe will have an impact on many countries in Asia, especially the countries which, which are dependent on exports. So I'll tie it into, I'll, I'll tie that question into how some of these questions can be answered with some of the longer term trends which are benefiting our markets. So for example, starting off with Vietnam, uh, yes, I mean, Vietnam will see, has already seen a decline in exports in the first quarter, ex exports declined by about 11%, but they've been weakening since, I would say October, November of last year. Uh, but that's because uh, Vietnam's uh, uh, exports account for 100% of Vietnam's GDP. It's a very export or trade dependent economy. Uh, given that they have been benefiting a lot from the supply chain diversification, as well as uh, uh, they've been having many free trade, free trade agreements with many, many regions or many, uh, many countries. Uh, but if you look at the chart on the top left, uh, this is the exports for Vietnam to the US uh, since the trade war began in, in 2018. So these are the export numbers per month from beginning of 18 to March 2023. Uh, Vietnam was doing about $4 billion of exports to the U.S. in the beginning of 2018. And now, despite the decline in exports, the U.S. are doing about $8 billion a month. So the, the monthly exports to the U.S. have doubled in the last probably five years. Uh, so it just shows you how important Vietnam has become as a trade partner for the U.S. and also how much they benefit from the supply chain diversification, especially from China. So the longer term trend is extremely positive. So I'm not so concerned about you know, six or seven months of uh, negative export growth for Vietnam because the long-term tra trajectory is very much in their favor. Uh, and also the chart on the top right shows you over the last decade that exports have grown by about almost 13% in cumulative terms. I don't think any other country, probably China, like excluding China has done this kind of growth uh, in terms of uh, uh, ex export numbers. So pretty solid growth there from Vietnam uh, overall. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm not so concerned, like I said, I'm not so concerned about you know, six or seven months or a couple of quarters of weak, weak export growth, I think they'll bounce back pretty strong because the trends are in their favor in terms of the low wage costs, the manufacturing supply chains moving into Vietnam, plus being a part of many free trade agreements. So yeah, pretty, pretty strong growth for Vietnam over there. And also as the next slide shows you, Bangladesh as well has been a pretty, uh, as the, uh, the chart on the top left shows you, it's Bangladesh, Bangladesh's exports have been uh, pretty stable and have been doing pretty well uh, over the last 18 or 24 months. I've not seen any major weakness in that export growth, despite slower <clears throat> export number, uh, slow economic growth numbers in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, I think for Jan for the month of March, exports were down about three percent, uh, but that's not following off a cliff. Uh, over the last twelve months, between April to March 2023, April 22 to March 2023, export exports grew about fourteen percent, 
So again, pretty decent numbers over there. And uh, I'm not so concerned again, uh, if for a couple of months export numbers weaken in Bangladesh, uh, because as a chart on the top right shows you again, Bangladesh and also Vietnam, as well as Cambodia have been one of the bigger beneficiaries of the trade war between US and China, especially for garment exports. Uh, they've in fact taken market share from China as the chart shows you in garment exports to the US. So Vietnam has increased market share quite significantly so has Bangladesh and Cambodia, Cambodia to some extent. Uh, so they've, they've really gained a lot in especially garment sectors in the garment sector compared to say the other Asian countries like Indonesia and India. Uh, well, of course, Vietnam's exports are more diversified as well. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good prospects for Bangladesh going forward as well. Uh, and as the next slide shows you, even outside of the ASEAN and South Asian frontier markets, I think Central Asia's region we've, we've been quite positive on over the last couple of years, especially last last year, last one year since the issues in, in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, there's a chart on the top left shows you, I've spoken before on, on webinars about, uh, on our webinars about how Georgia has benefited from the war in Ukraine in terms of seeing significantly higher tourism revenues as well as higher remittances, uh, but also the exports have been doing pretty well. Uh, they've done, in fact, very well over the last, especially last one year. Now, of course, some of this could be linked to uh, some countries routing exports to Russia via Georgia and some other Central Asian countries. I don't have the exact number for that, but it's not only that. I think they've really benefited a lot from the trade diversion. Many countries or many companies are now moving their goods through Georgia and also other Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, which is benefiting them. For example, uh, Georgia's main port on the Black Sea is operating at full capacity. Uh, because of these, uh, you know, these these uh, changes in trade routes, etc. And as the chart on the top right shows you, uh, even countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are benefiting from the new trade routes, which is called the trans caspian International Transport Route, which is being developed. It still, still take time to kind of gain scale, but clearly the trend is clearly the trend is in Central Asia's favor as many companies and countries look to, you know, move their supply chains or trade routes out of Russia and depend more on the Central Asian countries. Uh, and also not just from a trade perspective, also many highly skilled professionals in the IT and financial services sector or in general from the service sector, services sector have, have moved from Russia and Ukraine to say, for example, Georgia, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. So from a human capital perspective, it's very positive for these countries as well. Uh, and then also from the next slide, it's not just trade division or supply chain diversification. Tourism is making a very strong comeback. I think pretty much all in many parts of Asia, but also in, within our universe as well. For example, Sri Lanka has seen a pretty strong rebound as the chart on the top left shows you uh, since they've got some political stability in place over the last couple of months or last six or seven months. So, you know, to, they're doing more than 100,000 uh, tourist arrivals per month for the last couple of months. Even I think April is on track to do about 120,000 tourist arrivals. It's about 60% of pre-pandemic numbers, which is uh, pretty, pretty decent given the situation they were in last year. Uh, same time last year. And Vietnam, as, a, as the chart on the top right shows you, has made a very strong comeback for tourist arrivals. Uh, for the month of March, I think they were almost back to 70% of pre-pandemic arrivals. I mean, I was on the ground in Vietnam in, in March and also last month, uh, earlier this month as well. And I could see for myself, uh, the hotels were quite, in fact, very full, flights were full, and you could see a lot of tourists on the ground. So uh, significantly strong comeback for Vietnam from a tourism perspective, and that will really help them this year when they go, they're having softer economic growth in other sectors like exports or manufacturing or other parts of the service industry. So again, this is a trend to follow in for, follow this year as well. So that's a bit about the trends in our markets. So what I'll talk about now is the valuations, which is uh, the more important part uh, on, the, on the following slides. So if the next slide, please. Uh, so this is from a bottom-up valuation. These are the blue chip companies, some of the blue chip companies that the fund holds, we've been holding them for for a long time now, and uh, we, there's hard. I mean, we've been had this is the we've been this webinar for these webinars for about a year now, and there've hardly been any changes changes in these names. Maybe one or two additions here and there, but otherwise we, we are long term shareholders in many of these companies. And if you look at the valuation, the P /E ratio, the column from the third from the third right. All these multiples are pretty much single digit and low single digit. And even if they're double digit, they're less than 15 times. Very strong ROEs, very strong brands. So I think these stocks are, some of them are, have already re-rated this year. But I think there's a huge room for them to re-rate given the valuations uh, of these stocks. And also as the next slide suggests uh, or shows is uh, the valuation for the fund itself. The AFC Asia fund fund trades at about seven times, 6.9 times P to P, a P or 6.9 times to be precise, which is the all time low. 
so I think it's the bottom of the valuation. I think there's the the there are already the triggers are in place in terms of inflation coming off, interest rates speaking out, macro stability improving in our markets. So there's a lot of room for re rating for many of our markets and many of the companies in our portfolio. So I think if you're a long-term investor, this is the time to get into frontier markets or Asian frontier markets to be more specific. Uh, and also as the next next slide shows you, the, the discount of the, all pretty much all our markets traded a big discount to their five-year average, especially markets like Pakistan or Sri Lanka and also Kazakhstan. Uh, they're prime for re-rating because uh, you know all the worst is or I think we are we are beyond the worst for many of the markets and also as a as an asset class in terms of high interest rates, high inflation, the macro instability. I think we're beyond all that now. So I think going forward over the next three or four, if I take a three to four year view, I think the outlook is much better than what it was say over the last two years. Uh, and also the, as I said, the re the re-rating has already begun uh, in in places like Iraq and Sri Lanka. And also from macro perspective, as I mentioned. Uh, things are turning positive. The current accounts in Bangladesh and Pakistan and Sri Lanka have all been positive over the last couple of months. Uh, and just want to wrap up with the following slide. Uh, so yeah, like, like I said, I think uh, the portfolio fundamentals remain very strong, very attractive valuations, uh, solid companies, ROE is about 25%, pretty strong earnings growth of about 22%. So from a bottom-up perspective, I don't see anything wrong from, from the from a company perspective. I think as the macro situation improves in our markets and also globally, I think a very strong case for re-rating. So I think, as I mentioned in the last in the last webinar, the main theme for 2023 will be probably the opposite of last year. And people, I think there'll be more talk about lower inflation and interest rates speaking out, which should be very positive for investor sentiment. And we've already seen that this year. I think most markets have done pretty well so far in the first four months of this year. Uh, of course, volatility might might continue. But I think you should use, use that opportunity to, you know, get into equities if there's if there's any major correction. So I think overall, uh, I'll say what I said last time as well. This, this time, look at equities, uh, and I would be positive on equities with a 12 to 18 18 month view. So with that, I would hand over to Ahmed Tabakchali, who is the chief strategist of our AFC Iraq Fund. Over to you, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Usher. And uh, thank you all for attending and taking part in our um, fifth webinar. Well, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to speak to you all. Uh, can I have next slide, please? Okay, as you've seen so far, uh, the fund has had a phenomenal return this year, 47% uh, year to date. Now the year is still young and there is more time in the year to go to see where the return for the full year is. But I'm fairly confident that a turnaround has already happened in Iraq. In fact, it's been happening for some time, but it's only becoming visible uh, now. Uh, now, obviously, you've got to keep in mind the uh, index at the time. Uh, we are ahead of the index by about 10 uh, percentage points or so, but the index itself uh, being up 37, almost 37 percent for the year is should be seen. Uh, and I'll repeat that at the end in the, in, in the context of a market that's been seen, a devastating bear market that began in 2014. Uh, with the uh, 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 with the onset of ISIS. Next slide, please. Okay, the point I'm trying to make here is uh, it's the same argument that we've been making here actually ever since uh, end of 21 and solidifying it in early 22. And that's basically Iraq is a prime beneficiary of the changed uh, oil price environment. Uh, as recall the time, uh, those of you who, who read the Iraq comments at the time is even though oil prices were uh, very high, uh, we did believe that they were unsustainable. However, we believed also that a period of elevated to higher prices are quite likely given the change dynamics in the supply and demand for oil and in the changed world order. In an environment like this, Iraq is exceptionally uh, well placed for two reasons. One is that it's leverage uh, to oil prices and secondly, leverage to government spending um, in the economy. Now, again, very much unlike the, the cases that we've, we've seen worldwide in which currently governments, uh, central bank have spent the last year or so fighting inflation, uh, pursuing restrictive policies, and same thing with the government. In Iraq, it's the exact reverse. We've been following expansionary policies, which are very positive for the economy. Now, the, the uh, expansionary policies of government spending is expressed through its uh, budget, and the budget has a huge force on the economy, given how central the government uh, spending is to the economy. And the point here made is that uh, last year, I mean, you can see that the expansionary policy from the effect of the money supply. So in 2021, with expansionary policies, the money supply grew enormously. However, we had no budget for last year. 
which explains why you can see here the twin decline in the uh, chart of the bottom uh, left-hand corner and the, and the bottom right-hand corner. The money supply uh, decreased from uh, uh, up like in, the, in the high 20s to around 10%. And with that, uh, non-oil GDP declined. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, the government finally submitted its long-delayed uh, budget for 2023, which promises to be uh, very expansionary. Uh, again, benefiting from a bounty of whole prices and benefiting from a generally positive uh, macro environment uh, for the country. It possibly can inject something like 14, up to 14% liquidity injection to the 2022 estimates of uh, non-oil GDP, which is fairly significant. I'm, by the way, not taking into account a potential of another uh, 12, uh, so another 13%, which comes from investment spending. And the reason is that is partly skeptical that government uh, in, 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 in the country can actually do investment spending. We've always suffered from uh, lack of um, um, sort of uh, uh, absorptive capacity, which, which always keeps it below. However, any uh, spending of investment uh, uh, spending on the economy will have massive consequences on uh, the economy going forward. And in fact, by the way, in terms of the rebound, given the fact that the, the budget when it will come, it will be passed sometime around in May, I, I guess, and then be implemented in June. So its effect will be all back and loaded. And you, we will see a recovery in the money supply as well as in GDP. In fact, the IMF, prior to the release of the budget, the IMF predicted in its latest report about a month ago that uh, non-all GDP would go up by another 4.2% uh, 4, 4 uh, the following year. However, that was before taking into account the scale of this budget. So I think most likely that 4.2% is easily going to become maybe five, five and a half, six, which is fairly significant, um, uh, um, you know, in all. And it should translate eventually into economic activities and these would translate directly into uh, uh, company earnings and profits and therefore hopefully uh, an increased uh, move in the market. Next slide, please. Okay, now, as I said, this is uh, the, the, the strong strength in the economy and in the market is clearly should be seen in the context of uh, one, it's emerging from a brutal multi year bear market, as you can see the chart on the top right hand corner, which shows the index uh, from 2015. Uh, all the way till uh, now. And as you can see, the it decline has been significant, it wiped out something like 68% of all the gains that the market had which is fairly uh, uh, enormous. And even by now, following a uh, 37, almost a 37% rise, it is still under 50, uh, just over 50% uh, decline from its peak. And also it should be seen in the context of um, relative comparisons to other markets, i.e. if you look at all the other markets and you see uh, the massive base uh, as a technician would use uh, for the Iraq market suggesting a serious up move is uh, potentially likely over the next couple of years. Now, given the fact that it's a small emerging market, thin, it means that there's going to be a lot of zigzags, but I'm pretty confident that this uptrend we're seeing here will uh, be sustained. It might very well go sideways now that we've, we've gone to the top of the, um, the uptrend, but most likely it will resume uh, going forward. Now, uh, my, uh, as you all know, uh, we're all looking now at the crisis that's going, that could be happening in the uh, Western uh, banking um, thing, especially in the US or maybe elsewhere. Um, however, that's one of the attractiveness of emerging markets and frontier markets like Iraq, not only in that the um, there is no correlation, but also there is a, there's not only a correlation of markets, but there is no correlation of, of backing development. The argument that we've been making here over the last year or so, you might have seen it in the, uh, in the uh, banking investment thesis, and also we've discussed it on we discussed one, uh, two of the banks that we had, is that banking adoption is at a very, very early stages uh, in the country. And therefore, as the country adopts banking, it's going to reap all the benefit that everybody has seen a few years ago. Part of that can be seen now in that the crisis we've had with the currency, and I can uh, explore on that if somebody has any interest in the last uh, few months, has one of the things has led to an increased adoption of banking. With that, the top quality banks, which were behind the moves of the last couple of months, are the ones that are seeing enormous uptick in the number of uh, account opening and businesses and so forth. And so 
the, the correlation, the, the lack of correlation is not only, as I said earlier, in, in the performance, but also in the fundamental functioning of how a bank is. So our banks are only now beginning to, be, beginning to build the balance sheet that drive their earnings and drive their valuations. And unlike uh, banks that developed economies, which have had done this about 15, 20 years ago. So with that, I think I'm pretty much using all my time. Um, I would say the market looks very attractive versus uh, other markets, and it still warrants a serious look. With that, I end and give it to my colleague, Scott, who looks our uh, our Uzbekistan fund. To you, Scott. Thank you, Ahmed. Good day, everyone. So I'll start off before I get into talking about Uzbekistan, specifically the region. Over the past few years, I came up with the is sort of the thesis, the concept of uh, what I like to term the new fertile crescent. And it's this region spanning from the Middle East up through Central Asia, including Russia, China, India, and Pakistan. R really, it's the part of the region that I think is going to solidify and in, into a quasi socioeconomic corridor is the world bifurcates between East and West. And this is a region with great demographics, low debt to GDP, uh, a huge endowment of natural resources, and the majority of the world's manufacturing capacity. So as world bifurcates, it's a really exciting place to look at, but it's also a, you know, a from a frontier market perspective, uh, very underpenetrated, underappreciated. And I think over the next you know, handful of years, it's going to begin to change, as it already has been. No doubt this region is going to be anchored by uh, the global economic powerhouse that is China. So it's worth mentioning a few things that have happened in the past month and a half or so because China has really stepped up its uh, diplomatic uh, involvement in the region. You know, it, it's bringing a degree of peace to the Middle East. Uh, it's uh, brokered a deal between Saudi and Iran to begin discussing uh, reestablishing diplomatic relations, something similar between Saudi and Syria, uh, Saudi and Yemen, uh, including you know, uh, peace, so sort of a ceasefire agreement with the Houthis. Uh, and of course, uh, as you do, when your biggest trading partner, um, or when your biggest trading partner changes, typically your motives change. And if you look at the rhetoric that's come out of Saudi over the past half a year, it's been rather phenomenal. And, and Saudi's biggest trading partner is now China. So they announced that they're joining the Shanghai Cooperation Summit. And it was rather convenient that a few weeks ago, they announced a, a large production cut you know, for broader OPEC. Uh, so the world is definitely changing. And we think that Uzbekistan being at the geographic center of this new fertile crescent, um, it's, it's a really exciting investment opportunity, as has been the case since we first started looking at the country. Um, further, there's sort of, since the country's um, independence, uh, there, there's always been a bit of tension with Qatar, and they actually opened or announced the opening of their first embassy a few weeks ago. So um, the region is definitely solidifying, and we expect that only to continue. Next slide, please. Now in Uzbekistan, unfortunately on, on a rolling three month basis, not a whole lot happens. It, it's a frontier market undergoing rapid change in a variety of ways, shapes and forms. Uh, but nonetheless, the country is booming. Uh, GDP for the first quarter came in at five and a half percent. But generally for the capital markets on a daily basis, it's not a whole lot of news. Um, but over the past few days, we've started to see first quarter earnings for uh, a handful of companies, including some of our portfolio companies come out. And you know, our goal was to gain exposure to with the quote unquote blue chips of the market and the ones that also have the best leverage to economic growth. And it seems that we've picked the right horses. So the commodity exchange, or th these are three companies that recently reported earnings among a few others. Uh, the commodity exchange has had 41% year over year earnings growth. The cement producer is our biggest position. Uh, they bounced back from a rough year last year due to um, a lot of cement imports from an import duty being lifted to try and lower cement prices, but they also brought on a fourth production line. So that's a very encouraging one for us is you know, there's a lot more competition in the cement sector than, than there was a few years ago. And then the industrial company is an ethyl alcohol producer, which had its earnings grow 97%. Now, the first company, the Commodity Exchange, and, and this industrial company um, historically have paid us um, dividends which yield you know, in the teens, call it 13, 14, 15 percent. 
and, and based on the, the earnings that we've continued to see with the strong growth, we expect uh, those types of yields to persist in some of these companies. And also we have a handful of companies that when we started investing into them in 2018, 2019, 2020, they ended up cutting dividends to initiate CapEx programs really starting this year and over the next few years, a lot of those CapEx programs will be completed. So we anticipate that a handful of dividends are going to uh, be reinstated to these companies. Now, probably the most interesting news, if you will, over the past 45 days in the stock market is um, the announcement of the government's, I believe, third privatization program. Um, they're starting to get well known for announcing privatization programs that just sort of fizzle out but it was encouraging that there's actually a conference in Tashkent today and tomorrow um, where the president announced further details on this privatization program. Um, but nonetheless, they announced uh, that they developed an agency for strategic reforms. And basically the purpose of this agency is to carve out 30 SOEs, uh, which are the crown jewels of the economy in you know, general industry, mining, finance, et cetera. Uh, basically the companies that we have wanted to see be privatized over the past years, but have not for a variety of reasons. This agency for strategic reforms is in discussions with uh, Franklin Templeton. And if you look at what they did in Romania by taking a similar type vehicle and then listing parts of these SOEs in a holding company on the exchange and then bringing in foreign capital, we hope that something similar will happen because the ducks are beginning to align for, for this to occur. And if that happens, it would be, I don't want to say a game changer for the market, but it would be something that we've been waiting a long time for, where some of these really great companies, for example, one of the biggest gold mines in the world, uh, the third biggest copper mine in the world will be listed and we'll be able to get some diversified exposure to the economy, but also to further economic growth and, and a bit of commodity exposure. So, Nonetheless, we're very happy with how we're positioned, uh, but on the news front, it's, it's sort of quiet and slow, but steady, but nonetheless, the economy is doing very well and we're content, we continue to be optimistic with, with how we're positioned. With that, I'll pass it off to Vicente Nguyen, the Chief Investment Officer of our Vietnam Fund. Thank you very much, Scott. So hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm very happy to share with you about uh, the story today about Vietnam uh, fund. So Peter, could you move forward? So the first quarter already slowed the slowdown of Vietnam economy. So the GDP in the first quarter is only 3.3% because after a very impressive year in 2022, Vietnam seemed to come back. And because of the impact of the Western economy like in Europe and US, over there, the consumption is very weak. So the exports uh, decreased more than 10% in the first quarter. The only thing uh, optimistic for the economy is the, the, the domestic consumption. So retail is still very strong. So it reason why GDP can increase 3.3%. Actually, there are two reasons for the slowdown of the Vietnamese economy in the first quarter, first because of the, the weak consumption in, in the West, and the second uh, reason because of the crisis of the real estate sector. So a lot of investors, not only outside, but also inside Vietnam, they really worry about our real estate uh, crisis. But actually, people may be too much pessimistic because real estate this crisis is not new in Vietnam. We already faced four or five real estate crises in the past. And actually, whenever uh, a crisis of real estate happened, Vietnamese government was very smart. And they apply very intelligent policies and smart policy to improve the economy uh, aggressively uh, later on. So what did they do in the past? So let's see uh, the story, what they did in the last uh, real estate crisis in 2012. Peter, please go. So actually, when the real estate crisis happened, government, the first thing they did in the past, in 2012, they switched the money supply from real estate to manufacturing and public investment. They don't want to put money more and more money into real estate any longer, and then it will be stuck there. 
So in Starbucks, Ren has that they push a lot of money. They they sweep the money supply into manufacturing to support the small and medium enterprises, and particularly, they they plan a very giant public investment package. So, for example, this year they announced more than 30 billion US dollar public investment package. So, in 2023, so they will deploy a lot of billion US dollar project. For example, like long term international airports or a lot of highway along the country. So by this way, uh, the public investment and the supporting to manufacturing sector is created job in Vietnam and make uh, the GDP crowd to Im improve again. And together with the money supply suite and public investment, Vietnamese government also issue a lot of policies by many stimulus policies like the interest rate cut or tax cuts and even the financial subsidies to small and middle enterprise. For example, uh, last week, uh, last month in March and in April, the State Bank of Vietnam already cut 1% uh, the refinancing rate and discounting rate and they also cut the lending rate to support a small and middle enterprise in Vietnam. And right now, the government also submitted a 2% VAT cut. And it will be, it's expected to be approved in, in July. So on those policies, we'll support the economy in the next five years. And actually, it's already happened in 2012. And another event, special event in 20, 2013, that Vietnam and US signed a comprehensive partnership. And this helped the export from Vietnam to US increase aggressively. Like Richard just mentioned, it's increased 4.5 times in the last 10 years, from around 26 billion to more than 100 billion in 2022. And, and this year, the two countries expect to upgrade the, strategy, the partnership from comprehensive to strategic level. So if they can complete this upgrading, it will support the economy really, really much. And this is all the policies of the Vietnamese government they already did in the past and they were successful. And right now, they are just repeat, repeat what they already did in the past and they were successful. So what is the, the, the outcome of what they did in the past? Please go to, to the next slide. So the GDP crowd, if you look at the real estate crisis in 2012, the GDP crowd only 5% is one of the lowest in, in, in the case in Vietnam. However, in 2012, they started to to support the economy, what, uh, what as I say is the public, huge public investment package or switching the money supply from real estate to manufacturing or a lot of stimulus policies, tax cut, uh, rate cut, uh, financial subsidy. And it immediately support the economy grow in 2013, 14, 15, 16, and 17, particularly rich to very high levels, 7% uh, in 2018. It's been around five to six years after uh, the real estate crisis. So it's already proved that whenever that Vietnam's, Vietnamese government was very smart and successful. And I think that they will do it again this, this time and it will support the economy continue to improve in 2023, 24, 5, 6, and 7, or 8. So this is the outcome for the GDP growth. So how about if we index the stock market? Please go to the next. If you look at this chart, you will be say, wow, wow. Yes, that's correct. That's wow. Look at 2012 when the real estate crisis happened. The bottom, okay, the bottom is around 300 point something. And after that, the government supported the economy, the economy improved again, and the index started to, to accelerate. And within five years from 2012 to 2017, 
is up 175%. Yes, 175%. And it's reached a very high level in 2018 when the GDP growth hit 7%, as I told you. So actually, this is what we can expect. So right now, right now we, we have a renaissance crisis again and the index tumble from 1,500 something to the low of last year, 800. And now it's recover a little bit from 800 to 1,000. So between two renaissance crisis, you can see that the low in 2012 and the low in 2022 is completely different. So it's much higher. And right now, it's so that how the economy grow and the stock market grow. So we think those year, the index increased 175%. So who was the winner uh, in this uh, bullish market? Please go to the next. So this is a, some uh, typical positions that really who, who were really winner again the VN index and who they are who 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 they are who are they so PTP is the manufacturing company is the largest uh, domestic furniture is Potter in Vietnam TLG is another manufacturing company so you can see that because of money supply from real estate to manufacturing sector is really support the manufacturing sector and those companies the profit the profits of those companies increase sharply and, uh, and consequently it's, in, it's helped the stock price increase 28 times in five years, you can see. The next three companies are, are in the construction sector or steel company, construction company and construction material because of the huge public investment package in many years of Vietnamese government. So, uh, many, many billion US dollars pump into the, the public investment to build infrastructure, to build a bridge, to build a highway, to build a lot of things. And those companies benefit. So this is some example. Uh, they are uh, about the winner of the, the English. Please go to the next slide, Peter. So right now, after everything, we look at and we see right now in 2023, the valuation of the index is like 10 years ago. It's amazing, it's amazing. Actually, AFC Vietnam Fund, we entered the market in 2013, exactly on the right time when the government decided to support the economy. So we enjoy the upgrade of those markets. So we also up and right now, the second, the second chance in our history it's just come back. And the valuation right now is really come back to the last real estate prices in 2012, 2014, indeed. And I think it could be happen again. And we expect that in the next five years, in the next five years, the index can improve and increase maybe 100%. We, we do not know, but we, we expect it will exist the, the record high uh, last year. Uh, absolutely. So we are come back the second time that we already know what really happened in the past and it just repeat. And this is the reason why I think it's a golden chance. We cannot miss this chance again. We can miss the change in the past 10 years ago, but we cannot miss that chance again because we, we already saw it. We saw what really happened and now it just repeat. Okay, so if reason why myself, I, I surprised to the fund again in, in, in April and actually is the, the five concept, consecutive quarter, I subscribed my own money into the fund because I strongly believe that it will increase again. So this is the, the expectation that the, the Vietnamese stock markets will increase, the economy will increase, but how, the, how is to capture this crowd? This is our strategy. Please go to the next, Peter. This is our strategy. So in the short term, 2023, so instant sector still benefit in the high interest rate environment. So the reason why this 
insurance sector uh, play the most important and the biggest position in uh, uh, progressive weighting in our portfolio because they, they just benefit in, in this high environment. But in the mid and long term, we plan to switch the high dividend yield stock. That means they, they, they have very high dividend yield, but the growth is slow to the growth stock to capture the five years growth in the next in the next visions. Because right now the valuation of the uh, high dividend yield stock and growing stock over the same. So gold price and steel price are the same. So we switch to capture the crow in the next five years. This is what we do. And we will focus more on, on manufacturing sector stock and public investment benefits really like construction, steel, con steel company or, or uh, construction materials. So this is our strategy, how to capture and, and we think that we, we, we can make it. So please go to the next. And because, because uh, we, this is the performance of the fund in the last uh, 10 years and since its inception. So we are among the best. We completely outperform the index, modern double, and we are outperform against the two biggest um, fund in Vietnam. So I think, yeah, we, we can did it in the past. So in the next five years, I think we can continue to outperform the index again. So this is my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and uh, also especially Vicente. Please continue with the great outperformance of your fund. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for the interesting and insightful presentations. We will now answer some of the many questions we have already received from you, the participants. But you can still submit more questions during this Q&A &A session. I will start now one for uh, Ahmed. Assuming rising oil prices, would Iraq be in a position to increase production? What is the break-even price? Please, Ahmed. Okay, well, You're... thank you very much for that. Uh, well, uh, Iraq is always in a theoretical position to increase uh, production. Um, we have enormous capacity. Our reserves are substantially higher than, um, um, than, than our current production would, would, would indicate. That's one. Secondly, we are the uh, one of the lowest cost producers, so we will always have a margin. However, having said that, positives, the uh, historic, um, historically, we've always had issues with in seriously increasing production. I mean, once we got to where we are, we hit almost a wall. One of the reasons is to maintain current uh, production and to increase is we need what's called secondary recovery. As oil fields get somewhat older, you need to inject um, either gas or um, water into them to increase, uh, to maintain and increase production. Now, our most prolific fields have a long time well to go, but still they have that issue uh, with them. The recent signing uh, of a deal with Total, which is an incredibly positive deal over a 10 year for the company to invest $27 billion into, uh, into Iraq, which involves uh, among one of them is increasing gas production, capturing fairing gas, but also involves injecting 5 million uh, uh, barrels per day of water. Now that what it was delayed, I would say, by at least about a year, maybe even longer, and that would delay the increased production. However, uh, given our current uh, commitments to OPEC, um, it'll take us a long time before we really need to get, uh, currently Iraq is, uh, you know, increasing oil prices with the current production, even uh, just in return, because we're still, I think, about 15% below, I need to check my figures, but about 15% below the peak in production that we've had just before the onset of COVID. But for the meantime, we have plenty of time to go um, and to benefit from higher oil prices. Uh, keep in mind on just the short-term outlook on oil prices, currently uh, we are still in the early stages of seeing the Chinese demand for oil, China uh, is just emerging from its zero COVID, and it should mean um, more tighter oil markets uh, at year end. Uh, to answer you on the break-even point, I haven't got the figures as yet because it depends on the final uh, approval of the budget. But it's definitely in the high sixty, uh, high fifties, I would say. But I will. Uh, we're still working on those because there's, uh, you know, there's theoretical break-even, there's potential break-even, and there is. 
what are they doing with the uh, uh, with the budget? So still not final. Once that's there, we will know for sure the level of screen. At the moment, we have a long way to go before even reaching anywhere and you're worrying about break even point because we're just beginning to spend the budget. I think that's okay. about it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ahmed. Next question is for Scott. The Uzbekistan fund did well uh, the first years, but has been trading sideways since mid 2022. Year to date, the fund is up 0 0.8. Not that impressive either, uh, especially uh, considering the Uzbekistan GDP growth was 7.4% and 5.7% in two, 2021 and 2022. Any reasons for this? Are you in the right sector's stocks? And what will drive a better performance? So we're certainly in the right sectors and stocks. Um, uh, we're in the companies that I mean, we, we did well a few years ago because we're in the right companies. Now it's just what we're really seeing is multiple compression. It is... Um, Companies' earnings continue to outperform, but um, the share prices stay about the same, which has allowed us to accumulate more shares at um, great prices and great valuations. Um, if you look at this first re-rating a few years ago, this was largely domestic retail. Um, there was a lot of buzz in the stock market, and there were some marketing campaigns, and this pushed us up rather significantly. Uh, now what we're transitioning towards is you're, you still have local participation, but um, well, I guess a few things. You're seeing foreign retail come into the market. You have a lot of fund managers that are coming, um, just a lot of individuals that are looking at opening brokerage accounts there, it, but it's a bit of a bureaucratic process. So you're seeing them begin to come into the market, um, North American, European, Russian, et cetera, and, and starting to deploy decent amounts of cash, but still small. And I think the next wave is going to be foreign institutions who want to dip their toe. And actually in the past two weeks, I've spoken with one um, institution in the States and then I met a family office from the Emirates on the ground that's interested in the market. So interest is definitely picking up. Um, it, it's just a matter of time, but of course we want to be there before they come. That was always a strategy. That's why we launched the fund you know, early on in Uzbekistan's development. Um, equally so, when the CEO of the Tashkent Stock Exchange, hopefully in the next year, year and a half, is able to work with um, Clearstream to be able to create a link uh, for settlement and whatnot, this will allow foreign investors to purchase Uzbek equities without having to go through the very bureaucratic process, as I've mentioned in the past, um, of opening brokerage accounts on the ground. But equally so, there's legislation around the capital markets, which is sitting in a parliament, and when that is passed in due course, it's long delayed, that will allow for uh, brokerage accounts to be open digitally. So the next phase of growth, if you will, in asset prices in the capital markets, I think is going to come from foreigners. Though with sort of this people's IPO discussion and these 30 SOEs, which are hopefully going to be partially privatized, I'm aware of private insurance companies, um, banks, and then the two sovereign wealth funds that are interested in deploying capital. But Thomas and I were speaking about this a few weeks ago. One of the biggest private insurers in the, company, in the country wants to deploy a, a portion of their, um, of their float, um, their premiums into, um, into the stock market. So it's not going to take a whole lot of money to move the needle, but when it does begin to happen, uh, it, it should be very exciting. So right now, it's, you know, unfortunately, the market's relatively boring, but everything is moving in the right direction and we don't see any red flags. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's very clear. There's another question. I will answer this. Talking about high dividend yield stocks, how investors of the AFC Vietnam fund actually benefit from dividends? It is nowhere to be seen in your reports. Please do clarify. Uh, actually, the dividend in all our AFC funds will not be paid out because uh, it's very cumbersome and also for the investors in certain countries, some would like to, for, for, for many investors, it's not uh, from a tax per, uh, perspective point of view, not interesting to get the dividend paid out. So we uh, accumulate those dividends in the fund and it's, incre uh, it's uh, included in the NOV. And you can see the dividend yield on all the fact sheets uh, we are sending out or in the newsletter, we also always write about uh, 
PE ratio at the end of the of the fund manager comment uh, everywhere all times the PE ratio the price book ratio and the dividend yield. So Asia Frontier Fund the uh, dividend is uh, three point three five. I don't know which end day. I think uh, Vietnam fund is somewhere around five percent. So uh, there is a dividend. And then the last question, uh, maybe to Ruchir, it's uh, uh, in general. How are your economies positioned for a U.S. recession and end of the rate cycle? Yeah, in terms of the U.S., thanks for the question. In terms of the U.S. recession, as I was mentioning during my slides, I think it really depends on the country. For example, Vietnam and Bangladesh uh, do get a large part of their economic growth from exports, and especially Vietnam. And we've already seen Vietnam exports slow down. Uh, but like I said, I think even if exports slow down for the next couple of quarters because of a U.S. recession, I'm not so concerned because the long-term trajectory for these countries in terms of the export growth is quite positive, as I showed in my charts. They've you know shown double-digit cumulative growth rates for their exports, and this will be benefiting from the, from the supply chain uh, relocation from China into their countries. So maybe one year of slow growth is not a big concern for me. I'm, I'm looking more four and five years out. And that still looks very positive uh, from 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 my angle, and also from the uh, on terms of the interest rates. I think our countries are positioned very very well. Actually, many of the countries in our universe, especially countries like Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, they raise interest rates very aggressively, and some also raise before the Fed, uh, much before the Fed. So I think once the U.S. Uh, is done, or the Fed is done with interest rate hikes, and eventually, if the global central banks start cutting interest rates, I think. Uh, when the central banks and our universe start cutting, it'll be very aggressive because they also raise very aggressively. Uh, and they also, once inflation starts cooling off, they'll also cut very aggressively. So it should be very positive for equity markets in our, in our universe. And that's what I was saying at the conclusion of, of my presentation that uh, last year, all the talk of, talk of was about high inflation, high interest rates. I think this year and also probably next year will be about low inflation and probably even interest rate cuts, which will be extremely positive for our markets. And the domestic investors will come back very strong in our markets. Uh, and drive the stock market performance. So I think our markets are very well placed for any revision or uh, or, or, or a turn in interest rate or in the or turn in the interest rate cycle. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ruchir. This concludes our webinar today. And since we still had some unanswered questions, we will answer them directly by email. And if you have uh, further questions, you can always reach us by email. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. We will continue to hold quarterly webinars in the future and we will announce them in our upcoming monthly newsletters. Good night to our participants in Asia and to the others. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.